All right. Drugs are okay. All right, so at this point, let's recap. So we have a master regulator of uh, catabolism, which is ANP kinase, and a master regulator of growth and proliferation, which is TOR. Uh, and we have drugs, let's say in the case of TOR, of TOR that, that can inhibit TOR and have all these benefits. But uh, is there anything we can do with our food, right? This is, other than chemicals, I mean, we, we really modify a lot of our metabolism with our diets. So what, what's the impact? Now, it is known in many, many systems that uh, uh, diet, I mean, calorie restriction promotes lifespan. No question about it. Uh, that was known since the 20s. Okay, you put rats on a very low calorie diet and they will live longer. And you do the same thing for ev everything, from yeast to humans even. There are, there are groups of people that uh, eat every day no more than 1,300, 1300 calories. Now, this is very hard. These are you know, full adults, males weighing 130 pounds, 140 pounds and they're literally like skeletons. Okay, so this is very hard for most of us to do. Um, so there is a lot of interest now in trying to evaluate different diets for various health benefits, not just losing weight. This is a, this is a different situation. So before we discuss those uh, findings, it's important to introduce a concept, the geometric framework approach in evaluating nutrients and diets. And by the way, the, the Bemer lab here at AMO uses this approach. So I stole the slide from, from them. And the idea is this, we don't really take super defined diets with one nutrient or two, right? So we have complex diets. I mean, we really eat a lot of stuff every day. So how do you evaluate the impact of one nutrient over another, right? And, and how do you know where you get the most or where you have to stop eating and once you get enough and so on and so forth. So in an ideal world, when you know you have to get nutrient A and nutrient B on this axis, you eat until you reach this uh, magic uh, uh, concentration of both A and B, and you should be satisfied at that point, and you stop eating, right? But again, that works fine if you know, if you just need these two nutrients and you know exactly what uh, amount of these nutrients exist in your food. Um, you know, if uh, you really need uh, nutrient, one of these two nutrients, one of the other, and your diet is rich, let's say in B versus A, how are you ever going to get that amount? Well, you keep eating more and more and more until you get enough of A, right? So, so that's the whole idea. So you eat something that's rich in one part, but not on another part. You will not still stop eating, you know, until you get enough amounts of both nutrient A and nutrient B, right? And... In, in most situations, we are somewhere in between the, and you have to keep going until you hit a magic number. You satisfy whatever it is that you need to satisfy. All right, back to, uh, so how do we apply this geometric network? We look at the, the, the framework, uh, you know, depiction of uh, dietary, of diets. Well, okay, so how do we compare, you know, the different diets? let's say a rich protein, a protein rich diet on the X axis and a carbon carbohydrate rich diet on the Y axis. What does that do to the master regulators that we discussed, TOR and AMPK, TOR and AMPK, so here at the, at the slide. So it turns out that the more protein you have, so this is the level, so this is the, the color red means higher, okay, blue is lower. So the more protein you have in your diet, the more you will activate TOR. That's when the activity of TOR is the highest, when you have a ton of protein in there. Um, conversely, the MPK activity will be higher when you have high carbs and low protein, okay? Anything with high protein, so in here, look at the MPK activities, it's blue, right? So that's not good for MPK activity. Does that make sense? Yes, a protein-rich diet, remember amino acids, you can do, you can make more protein, you can make anything with amino acids. You break them down and they are all gluconeogenic, you can make uh, anything you want. You can make your lipids, you can make your proteins, you can make your carbs, and you can make new cells. So that will activate or If you're on a high carb diet, um, you will activate AMP kinase, so what you will do at that point uh, is to, uh, to activate catabolism. So you start breakdown, 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 not so much biosynthesis. So high TOR activity here, the pathway will look a lot like, you know, proliferating cells. AMP, high MPK activity, the pathway will look a lot more like a quiescent cell when you have the central metabolic pathways working, TCA cycle, oxphos, and glycolysis. All right, so let's watch a video.
uh, of uh, something that I think is very interesting. So I don't know how many of you remember uh, last time, I believe it was eight years ago in 2020, there was, a, so all of you were alive, maybe you remember it, in Texas there were just so many um, crickets going, you know, it had been called the cricket apocalypse, you know, every, I don't know, the life cycle, but maybe we're up for another one this, this summer, but there were crickets everywhere, right? Where do they go? So this is uh, the Mormon cricket, the classic, um, yeah, this was his YouTube video. Um, and you can see this out in the field, you know, out in, out, they just, you have all these crickets and they run around, but they all go to the same place. So they seem to have a purpose going somewhere, right? Where do they go? How do they know where to go, number one? And why do they go there? Okay, so I will give you the answer of why the cricket smarts in a, in a particular direction and, and uh, why they go where they need to go. So the experiment was done to evaluate the effects of diet um, uh, in mice. Uh, it was a super big study, you know, published in a very prominent journal uh, five, year, five or so years ago. And they used an enormous amount of mice. These are very expensive experiments, okay. They fed them 25 different diets. The mice were allowed to eat as much as they wanted, ad libitum, kind of like, people, right? We can eat as much as we want. And the diets varied really in four things, the amount of protein, fat, carbs, and energy. Okay. So the investigators went to test several things. You'll see what they measured uh, based on altering this general, you know, uh, components of every diet. And of course the energy equivalent. And they, these mice got some super good health care. They were at the, from late middle age and on. So they were monitored all the time with various scans and we know exactly the effect of these diets uh, on, uh, on, on mice, on the physiology of mice. So first of all, they normalized that all the diets had the same dry matter intake. Okay, so it's not a matter of uh, how much uh, just bulk uh, you eat. Okay, the, qu the quantity of the stuff changed in these different diets. Okay, the, you know, the anywhere from five to 60% in a super high protein diet and the same for all these other components. But the, the amount of stuff uh, that covered these different uh, possibilities was the same. So that was uh, accounted for. And then they looked at, um, move myself here. This is actually really cool. Um, they look at when, oops, when the mouse, when the mice stop eating, okay. Uh, at, at which point uh, they could measure, you can measure in the mice how much you put, you put in and because they eat, uh, you know, freely as much as they want, then you see how much is left. So you assume that, that whatever was gone, they ate it. So it turns out that mice ate a lot less or when they were on a high protein diet, right? And this is a half maximal nutrient intake, which is a general um, marker, let's say, of how much they eat. When they were on a high carb diet, okay, um, they ate more. When they were on a high fat diet, this is when they ate the most ridiculous amount of food, okay, super much. So if you're hungry and you, you know, you study very hard for a biochemistry exam or something like this, and, um, um, you know, and you're hungry, you have the munchies, what's the best thing to do to eat a high fat snack or a high protein snack? You know, a high fat snack will not satiate you. You will, you will feel hungry soon after you finish one snack. Then you, want to, you want to eat a second one, a third one, and a fourth one. That's the situation here. On the other hand, if you have a high protein snack, you will feel full. You will be satiated and you won't need to eat any more again. I mean, and that kind of makes sense. I mean, to me, the most filling uh, meal I can have is like a steak. How often are you hungry an hour or two after you ate a steak? I mean, that, that's just impossible, right? So that's the situation here. And so that's kind of nice to see. So whatever, that already gives you a clue that the mice really are after protein. They want to eat protein. So the moment they eat uh, a little bit of protein, uh, you know, this much of food, but it's super high on protein. So not a little bit of protein. They, they eat a lot of protein, but not as much food. They're not hungry again. They don't need more. Conversely, you know, on the high fat diet, they have to eat all the time. Um, is that, does it have anything to do with energy? Uh, no. So they're not really after energy. Okay. Because, uh, this is the, the high protein diet, the high carb diet, the high fat diet. 
And of course, if they are, you know, they stop eating, even though the energy intake was low, okay? And that shown by the color blue here, right? As opposed to the high fat diet, of which of course is super high in energy. We have talked about how good uh, fats are. Uh, you know, you burn them down the beta oxidation, you get a lot of kilojoules, but um, clearly they were not after energy. Otherwise they would keep eating here on the high protein. Right? So, you know, we're, we're hungry, not because we don't have enough ATP for the most part, right? We are hungry for something else. Uh, otherwise we would be completely saturated with the most energy rich food we can eat, which is fat. So, so that's, this is really the moral of these graphs. Eating high food, food will not satisfy you and, you and, and make you eat less. Instead, you know, you keep eating more and more and more. By why do the crickets march? All right, so let's watch this again. It's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, it's really, what I want you to pay attention to is how they have a direction. They march to a specific point. They are not random. There is occasionally a weird guy, but but all of them go from left to right, right? So, so that's the idea. Why do they do this? So the researchers did this, okay? And they did the simple thing. So they took, they were out in the wild. I will explain this graph. This, whoa, hold on. We got the video going again. Wow, look at the Mormon crickets, all right. Stop, all right. Okay, so I assume you share, hold on, you share a screen. Yes, okay. Hold on, I, it's, I hope I haven't uh, destroyed. Yeah, there we go. All right, let's go back to this slide. So the researchers went and caught some of these crickets and they fed them. They fed them a high carb diet, high fat diet, or a high protein diet. And then they put them up. So the way you do it is you have little, uh, little plates and you put liquid food uh, that's higher fat, high carbs, or high, or high protein. And they go in and eat a little bit. And then you release them back in the wild. And what they do in the wild, it turns out many of these crickets, they will cut a cricket in front of them and they do cannibalism essentially. So, okay, so they will eat uh, another cricket. But here is the difference and I have, I swear I have never seen anything like this in uh, my scientific career where on the x-axis the label is amount eaten of victim. Right? <laughs> so they march, they eat the cats, you know, the, the cricket, the unfortunate cricket that's uh, ahead of them and they then the researchers went in and measured how much of the victim was actually eaten. And that's the, 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 the value shown on the x-axis. And they compare that for the different diets, the, whatever they had given them before, the little snack they had before, whether it was high protein or, or high carbs or high fat. Always for fat, there's a special fat that you give to insects. So it turns out that if they were fed a high protein diet, a high protein snack, before they were released back in the wild and allow them to catch another victim, they, they will not, they would cut the, the guy, the, I mean, the, the, they, will, they will cut another cricket, but they will not eat a lot of it, okay? So the amount eaten of the victim will be, you know, some of it will be eaten and then they will go on. So we're not really hungry, okay? I mean, they follow their genes, they, they caught the guy and they ate some of it, but uh, they wouldn't finish it off. So they were, they were stuffed, essentially. However, if you had given them a high carb or high fat diet, they will eat more of the victim which means that the crickets are really after protein. And if you think about it, you are out in the desert, right? And there were many other hypotheses. Why are they marching in this way? Is it for mating? Is it for something, you know, whatever. Uh, and it turns out they are marching for protein and you are out in the desert. The best source of protein is the cricket in front of you. And likewise, you, are, if you are a cricket, are the best source of protein for the cricket behind you. So you have to run, you know, in one direction, Number one, to cut the guy in front of you and avoid being caught by the guy behind you. So this is why they really march, okay? And we know from this experiment that they are, right, they are after protein, right? That, that's what they're missing. They're not missing, you know, um, uh, 
carbs or, or fat. They're missing protein. But so if you give them protein in advance, a protein snack, they don't eat as much of the victim they managed to cut. Right? So it's a remarkable experiment. Uh, it's, it was quite something. All right. So uh, in terms of uh, modern life uh, diets, you know, what's the Atkins diet? Uh, Atkins diet is a very high protein diet. So, and it makes you thin, or people promote it because it, it, for losing weight. Um, and as long as fat intake is low, yes, uh, you eat a high protein diet, you will not eat as much, you will feel full, just like the, the mice that we saw or the crickets, right? So that kind of makes sense. And, and you do, and you look at the, and you do lose weight. You look at the body fat of these mice now, now back to mice that were uh, fed all these diets. So if you give them a high protein, uh, a high protein diet, and you look at the body fat, so the colors here look at body fat. The ones on the high protein diet shown here had the lowest amount, that's the blue color, of body fat. Um, high carb diet was somewhere intermediate, and of course, you know, you are on the, on the high fat diet, and, and you, know, you have a lot of body fat, what do you expect? So we're not gonna consider anymore the high fat uh, uh, fed mice. Clearly they, have, uh, they eat more, they are fat, uh, but uh, an interesting comparison now is between the high protein and the high carb diet. Right. So what did I say? The high protein and the high carb diet. So high protein, high carb diet. You look at these mice. So this is the protein to carbon ratio. So obviously this is a super high uh, uh, protein. That's the Atkins, okay, mouse. It's nice and thin. You know, this is a whole body scan and you look and it's a nice looking mouse. Uh, you're on the high carb diet, okay? So you know, high, lots of pasta, let's say, now you're a little rotund. The mice on average are more, more body fat. I mean, which is another way of uh, explaining this data. Right? They, they are a little fatter, right? The high carb diet. So, okay. That's, again, it's a high protein uh, uh, diet. It's the Atkins scenario. You're definitely looking, uh, looking uh, thin, but is it good for you? Now define good a general overall catch-all metric is lifespan, right? How long do you live? And here we're looking at the median lifespan of these diets. We're looking at the, at the um, high protein, high, uh, um, high carb, high fat diet. And it turns out that uh, your lifespan is the highest shown here in red. When you have a high carb, this is carbon carb intake on the y-axis and low protein. So high carb, low protein makes you live really long, right? Uh, so likewise, likewise here, you have high carb on the carb intake on the x-axis, fat intake low. This is when you live the longest. A high protein diet, okay, um, it's not good. So this is protein intake. If you are here, this is the Atkins scenario here. Hold on. So this mouse, high protein, low carb, would be reflected somewhere here high protein on the x-axis, low carb on the y-axis, right? Look at its lifespan. It's deep blue as opposed to deep red for the opposite. So somehow, okay, this rotund mouse, more fatter mouse, lives longer, is healthier than the high protein diet mouse, which is thinner, right? So this one looks good, but this one lives longer. Why is that? Why? So this, uh, this is very perplexing, right? So it turns out that, you know, as we saw crickets and so, whatever, so they, they are wired to eat, we are all wired to mice too, to eat more protein. This mouse will eat more protein, will stop, sorry, will stop eating, um, it will feel full. We are programmed to go after protein. And humans is the same way, by the way. Yet a low carb, so ignore the fat here, fat is bad, but a uh, uh, high carb, low protein diet appears to be better for you okay, in the long run because you live longer. In effect, this is a Mediterranean diet, by the way, here. So how do you explain this? Why do we have this drive to eat protein? Well, people took some insects and they took a fruit fly classic laboratory animal, you know, the Q-fly, which is a house fly in Australia, and they took the field cricket. And you look at the protein that they eat and you look at the carbs, but here you look at also the lifetime egg production, okay? And it turns out 
where you are on the, you know, the more protein you eat, okay, the more eggs you will produce in your lifespan. So that kind of explains the drive to eat more protein, right? Remember, evolution selects through populations. So evolution doesn't work on an individual. So this effect that you see is on an individual. But on a population, what really matters is how many progeny you produce, how many eggs you lay, how many children you have, right? And for that, you need to have protein. Why? Because to make new cells. This is, this is really what it is. This is to drive biosynthesis. Your whole anabolism has to be very high, okay? So you can have more, more progeny. Um, but, but you may ask, isn't that bad for the individuals? Well, evolution again doesn't care. As long as you procreate and you generate children, I mean, you're basically done. I mean, this is, uh, there is nothing more to do for the population. So, so what if you don't live as long? I mean, as long as you've lived enough, long enough to generate your progeny, you're done. So in this case, what you see is really the evolutionary drive that, conserved, that is conserved from geese to insects that you saw, mice and humans, to go after protein. Um, which, of course, now on an individual basis, especially if you're a middle-aged man like myself, you, you see how that can have adverse effects uh, in terms of lifespan. And so that's the general idea, right? So, so the data I showed you, it explains why we're after protein. It explains you know, the, the basis of it. It's all, it all has to do with a pro maintaining a proliferative status. And once you do that, then you can take a hit as a population on, the, on lifespan. Um, but, you know, if you care about now the individuals and the elderly and, and, and um, uh, delaying as much as possible the onset of all these chronic diseases, you know, being on a high fat diet is, as, a, as a guideline is not really, on a high protein diet as a guideline is really not going to help you because you're going to get all kinds of uh, um, chronic diseases. And also explains why, sorry, one more thing, why... Um, um, uh, TOR inhibitors, which promote, you know, remember, TOR promotes anabolism. You inhibit or you inhibit anabolism, and all of a sudden, okay, uh, you live longer. So this is, this is the idea here. You are on a high-protein diet, you will activate TOR, you will activate anabolism, and, but you will not live as long. Here, you're on a high-carb diet. What does that do? It activates AMPK. Okay? You go through catabolism, you do your glycolysis, DCA cycle, oxfos, and you will live longer. Okay, so in general, at the molecular level, what really happens is a high TOR uh, promotes aging. Therefore, that's why rapamycin, which inhibits TOR, uh, increase, increases longevity. And any other interventions that also increase AMP kinase, and there are many other uh, hits that uh, suggest that that's how they, they, they do this, they will also promote longevity. So this is where the, the, the science is going in terms of uh, signaling pathways, which ones you inhibit and which one you promote in order to, to live longer. So you inhibit TOR and you activate AMP kinase and that will increase health span and longevity. Now, is there any way to do this with your diet? So I'm not on any calorie restriction, uh, but uh, this uh, uh, study was published. It's a, per a periodic diet that mimics fasting, okay? And it has all kinds of benefits. So it increases longevity in many model systems. And in healthy individuals, uh, humans, uh, it seems to improve health span uh, in a variety of ways. So I heard about this uh, when we were at a meeting uh, you know, five, six years ago, and I, I um, presented the ibuprofen results that I had told you about earlier. And they presented this data. It wasn't published yet. So I asked my collaborator, who's Brian Kennedy, the one who discovered uh, his um, you know, um, the one who discovered that uh, uh, TOR inhibition promotes longevity. And I said, Brian, does that work? He uh, says, yes, uh, it has really good effects, this, this periodic fasting. And now it's very popular. You've seen in the news or, or everywhere. Uh, but I decided to give it a shot. And, and I said, by the way, I said, uh, what exactly is in this uh, diet that uh, they, they gave to people? And this, uh, Brian says, I didn't know at the time. He didn't know. He says, I don't know because this author, the last author, wants to start a company and send you uh, pre-packed foods that you can eat. So the way this works is uh, instead of being on a fasting diet every day or calorie restriction, just five days a month, consecutive days, you only eat 750 calories a day. That's all you get. And 
importantly, these 750 calories cannot come from protein. So you limit your protein intake. You try to inhibit all, okay? Uh, so that's the whole idea. So instead of taking rapamycin, you take uh, very low protein for five days. And they found that this periodic fasting um, improves uh, lifespan and stress resistance in yeast. Uh, it, 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 improves, it increases the lifespan of mice and has all these beautiful things. And in humans, for just five, four or five cycles, uh, all these risk factors you know, for diabetes, cancer, and, and aging went down, inflammatory markers went down, um, uh, you know, cholesterol went down, lipids, all kinds of stuff. So I figured, okay, I'll, I'll try it. And I was doing it until last year. I was doing it for five years straight. And now with my life the way it is and the schedule, I cannot do this anymore, but I will get back to it hopefully at some point. So this is the last slides I'm going to show you are really me. Okay, this is uh, before I got on this uh, periodic fasting. Uh, in the spring of 2015. You know, by the way, I never had any health issues, but this is my blood um, uh, panel, the lipid panel. You know, cholesterol was 178, uh, triglycerides uh, were 66 and so on and so forth. So below, uh, you know, the, the triggers, but still they were what they were, right? So within a year, so I was on this diet uh, for a year, Oops. doing it up to 2019. Uh, and uh, the results were remarkable. I essentially um, verified on my own all these things that were published, uh, the various markers, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, in that paper, I saw the same benefits. Okay, so for example, my cholesterol now is about 120, okay, and triglycerides are like 30 or something. So it's, uh, yeah, it's something to, to, to think about. So I can definitely vouch for that. Now, this is not something you should be doing um, be, uh, because you are too young and, and you may want to have progeny. So you really want to be, you know, in that situation, you start like, so you don't want to be on a low protein diet or fasting diet, you know, at that young age, because uh, you may have other things in mind. In my case, I was done. I had my children, so I'm finished. Uh, but, um, and also you should be doing it when you're 65 or older, because at that point you lose a lot of uh, muscle mass. Uh, uh, so there is muscle loss and, and uh, it has no benefit. So it does have a, it, it improves all these things, all this low protein intake, as I said, up to a point. Once you know, you are beyond a certain age, then, then it becomes an issue. All right, so we will close with that. 